Hello. Hope you guys are all surviving the coronavirus, that you're all in isolation and you take care of yourselves. This is our online classes. I'm planning on doing all our classes uh, through this medium. You can still access the PowerPoints and the materials through the OneDrive link that I have sent on Show My Homework. So if you want to go it alone, that's all there. The videos are embedded, but for those of you who want to have more of the online class type feeling as if it would be in our normal classes, then I recommend that you uh, stick to this. Um, I will try to keep my regular uploads happening. That way you are being consistent and following along. If you have any questions at all, feel free to email me. You've got my email that you have. Um, but for the most part, I want to head straight into it. Um, and if there's any questions at all, you know what to do. So uh, today is lesson number seven. We did do a bit of this last Friday, but because uh, three quarters of the class was missing and we only got through about half of the content, I, I feel like it's worth going back over this again. So let's get straight into the lesson. So our, our learning objective. Today we are wanting to understand how the nature of family has evolved over time. This is a very simple kind of concept. So we aren't going to be able to do the discussions as much because we don't have you all here. So you're going to have to sort of more think about this amongst yourselves. We'll watch a video on the origins of the family. Uh, lots of reading today and um, next uh, lesson we'll be doing some more responding to what we've learned about today. So let's get straight into it. So where does the nuclear family come from? Now I want you to think more so this idea of a mother, father, kids, married, in a house, happy suburb, where does this originate from? Like, what was, it hasn't always been like that. So where, where does this idea of uh, the nuclear family come from? And think about how these changes have come about. You might, you might not be aware of what it was like in the medieval ages. Um, some of you may, may have learned some stuff in history, but what, what sort of has changed over time? And that's what this class is going to be about. Before you do, um, before we do go into that, we're going to watch a video very quickly. So I'll just hand it over to, uh, well, this wonderful video. Here we go. We're all pretty familiar with the image of the American nuclear family, with two parents, a couple of kids, and a loyal canine companion. But when did we start thinking of the nuclear family as the most natural one? So with Thanksgiving coming up, we thought it would be fun to talk about family. It's safe to say that most of us know more than a few families that don't fit into the typical nuclear family mold. Yet despite this diversity, if asked to describe a prototype of the American family, a lot of us will still recall images more reminiscent of Leave it to Beaver than anything we've witnessed in real life. But if all of us can imagine or know families of all shapes, sizes, and styles, then why does the expression nuclear family still get lobbied around to represent some sort of idealized unit? Well, before we dive into the incongruous history of the family structure with the same name as the center of an atom, we should ask ourselves, what is the history of family structures before the idea of the nuclear family became the shorthand for normal? So this answer varies based on time period, region, and culture. Kinship, or the recognition of relationships between people within the same community or biological family plays a huge role in how we define our family structure. And yes, everyone all over the world has a biological ancestry, but who and what we call our familiar relations is not that cut and dry. In the Iroquois system, your father's brothers were also your father, and your mother's sisters were also your mother. In the Ka Nation kinship system, your mother's brother's daughter, who we would call your cousin, is also called your mother. And in the matrilineal Majo culture in Northern China, women freely chose their partners and who your biological father is, is not considered very important at all. Frequently, your biological father wouldn't even live with you, and your mother's brothers often fill in the role of the father figure. Plus, all of this is frequently even more complicated by language barriers. So if you think your family structure is weird, trust me, it's not. But in terms of European history, from the 1500s until the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, it was common for peasant families in Northern and Central Europe to live in two generational households, consisting of the parents as the older generation in charge of the family, and the children as the second generation. That was also because kids were a big part of the economic structure of the household, working with their parents to sustain the family's livelihood. At any given point in time, only less than 10% of these peasant families lived intergenerationally, in part because a lot of the grandparents didn't live long enough to make this a reality. And by the end of the Middle Ages, most families in those regions
regions were in the traditional nuclear format, owing in part to the influence of the Christian church-sanctioned monogamy. By contrast, in the same periods in Eastern and Southern Europe, intergenerational living was much more common, with several generations of the family all living within the same household. But not everyone thought the nuclear family was ideal. In the 19th century, researchers who were studying family structures theorized that nuclear families they observed in manufacturing regions of Western Europe and in England might not be the best, since once children left to form their own families, it left elder parents alone. There are also other structures that were practiced, such as conjugal families or families that were connected through marriage, and consanguineal families, families that are connected by their common bloodline. But another big part of how families were defined centered on the question of marriage. Although there are more contemporary notions that marriage are about love, fidelity, building a life together, and making cute centerpieces out of mason jars, that wasn't always the case. Marriage is an ancient custom dating back thousands of years, and evidence shows that marriage customs have varied as widely as family structures. According to Stephanie Kuhn's author of Marriage, A History, a lot of those marriages were more about family connections than love. What marriage had in common was that it really wasn't about the relationship between the man and the woman. It was a way of getting in-laws, of making alliances, and expanding the family labor force. How romantic. And marriage includes a laundry list of options, like arranged marriages, where families choose their children's spouse, or polygamy, where there are multiple marriages within one defined group. That includes both polygamy, or one man with multiple wives, and polyandry, or one woman with multiple husbands. And although polygamy is the more commonly known practice, accounts of polyandry exist in approximately 53 societies around the world, such as Tibet. Although religious marriages have a long history, as centuries have passed, the state has played a larger and larger role in regulating marriage practices. So a marriage can have a religious ceremony, a civil ceremony, or a combination of both. And it wasn't until the last 250 years or so that the idea that marriages should be love matches started gaining traction. So we've established that families have lots of different shapes, sizes, and customs. So that brings us to our next question. When did the nuclear family become shorthand for the American household? Well, the use of the specific phrase nuclear family in English can be dated back to the 1920s. But as the evidence shows, the concept or form of the nuclear family wasn't exactly new. But in the 1950s US, the Cold War was accompanied by an economic boom, the growth of suburban developments on the outskirts of major cities, and a growth in the middle class and a population surge, all of which encouraged the nuclear family. But it wasn't inherently a natural development. PSAs and how-to videos broadcast across the country were specifically designed to teach families how to behave appropriately and what to do if they were going to achieve this stylized ideal. But these realities were marked heavily by divisions of class and race, as the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s was occurring simultaneously. So even though in the 1960s, some historians and sociologists interested in family structures were concluding that nuclear families were the only widely spread version of the family, the contemporary reality for many American families differed greatly from the ones presented in popular media. But I mean, if even the Brady Bunch was blended, then that leads us to asking our final question. Is the nuclear family really the most popular form in the US? And if not, what kind of families are out there? Well, let's look at the data. According to the US Census Bureau, in 2012, 66% of households were family households, down from 81% in 1970. And in those same years, married couples with children under 18 dropped from 40% to 20%. Black and Latino children were more likely to live in single parent households, and households with only one person jumped from 17% to 27%. So it seems that while married couples with kids still describes a substantial number of families in the US, that number number is shifting every day. But in the last hundred years, marriages and families have continued to evolve, at least in regards to the types of unions becoming legally recognized and visible in the popular consciousness. The political and legal system of a region can determine the types of marriages recognized by law, which in turn impacts the type of families that are most visible. In 1967, the Supreme Court case of Loving v. Virginia struck down all laws prohibiting interracial marriage in the United States. And in 2015, Obergefell v. Hodges ruled that laws against same-sex marriage in the US were unconstitutional. But families also exist outside of legal and state recognition, and that's not a new phenomenon. In ancient Greece, alumni was the term for children who were fostered by another family, and there is legal precedent for adoption dating back to the Code of Hammurabi in the 18th century BC. And today, there are over a quarter of a million adoptions worldwide every year. So clearly, blood ties, marriage, and children aren't the only ways that family can be defined. So how does it all add up? Well, marriages, families, and kinship groups 
groups have been going strong for thousands of years in almost every configuration that we can think of, and that includes the nuclear family. But while the image of the nuclear family is often held up as the ideal and only form a family can take, whether or not that's true seems to vary by social group and region. But as we gear up for the holidays and think about passing various side dishes to members of our own family with both joy and maybe a little bit of caution, it's important to remember whatever form, shape, or size it takes, we have the power to define what family should look like for ourselves. So what do you think? Any funny family stories to share? Drop them below with all of your questions and we'll see you next week. Okay, so um, that gave us a, a really good overview of um, these, these changes, where, where we've come from, and you can see clearly that there are some changes that are moving as well in one direction. Um, so as we go, families are also evolve, evolving. So let's move on. Um, so we've got some reading, so please make sure you are on page 36 of your booklet. Um, you should have access to the uh, electronic version, which is on the OneDrive as well, if you don't have your booklet, which is why I recommend that uh, you have access to that file, uh, the folder, sorry, if uh, you don't have or if there are things that are missing. That way you can still make out most of the content. This um, still, uh, I pretty much put the booklet on here, but there are some questions which you'll need to answer very shortly. So it is wise that you have that there. So let's get into doing some reading. Uh, I'll just turn my camera off. It's not needed. Okay, so, uh, just very quickly, there we go. Okay, so, um, the pre-industrial families. So these families were units of production. All family members would work and contribute to the family survival. Work would be divided by gender. Uh, males doing tasks outside the home, such as hunting food, gathering firewood, building and fixing structures, such as huts and home. Females would do tasks within the family, such as the cooking and the cleaning. Life was hardest for the poorest families. Uh, families would provide many other functions, so they would do a lot more than the ones that you get today. So they'll do educational, teaching their children about the world around them. Uh, the rich families would teach their children to read and write uh, in, in arithmetic, maths. Healthcare, so caring for the elderly and sick family members. And there was no welfare state to look after families at this time. And when I say welfare state, I mean that the government is not providing, like an NHS, it's not providing... Um, if you're looking for work, it's not, finding, it's not providing a job seeker's allowance. So Parsons, sociologist, he argued that families were largely extended family networks with most members living together under one roof. Work and land ownership for the richest people was organized through the extended family and all functions were provided by the extended family. And Peter Larset from 1965, he however studied parish records of 100 English villages from the 16th to the 19th century and found that family units were small. So parents and children were living together without other generations. And this would suggest that in England, at least, the nuclear family has always been common. During this period of history, roles were determined by birth. So a child born a peasant is likely to die a peasant. Um, so social, social mobility was virtually non-existent. This then brings us, we are going to then move into industrialized families. So after the Industrial Revolution, families, um, sorry, I need to get that up. So there it is. So after the Industrial Revolution, and which is 1760 to 1840s, uh, families moved to cities. And this is a process called urbanization. Um, these geographically and now socially mobile families were definitely nuclear in that there were two married parents that lived together with their biological children. Fathers tend to take the instrumental role and the mothers the expressive role. Now, if you've forgotten what those are, you need to look back into your work booklet. Children were expected to work from a young age and state uh, and state education in England wasn't introduced until 1870. This meant that slowly the state was taking some of the functions away from the families. Which brings us to contemporary families. So the, the contemporary family is characterized by family diversity. And you would remember this from the uh, Rappaport study, which went about finding the five different ways um, there were family diversity. And many of these types of families in... Um, 
sorry, and sorry, they would look at also um, many different family types in society. So contemporary families uh, tend to be more self-sufficient or reliant on the state. It's uh, kind of one or the other. There is great diversity of roles performed in these contemporary families. So it's not always tied to traditional gender roles, although traditional gender roles have not exactly gone away, particularly um, within the case of immigration from countries where you do have more of a traditional gender role, particularly from the sub-Saharan Africa um, region, uh, as well as the Pakistan-India region, uh, whereas you get more of the, the diversity of roles you more get from the European, uh, more wealthier countries in particular where um, this has been a, a common thing with particularly equality in terms of laws and stuff like that, whereas um, in particularly the sub-Saharan regions that is not the case. Okay, so this brings us into your comprehension task. Um, so with that, you will need to uh, go to page 36 and I want you to fill out this table here. It is, it's, it's very easy. So you look at the type of family. So we've got the pre-industrial family. You're going to tell me what type it was, what were the functions of the family, what was the rough size, and what were the roles that were performed by the family members. So pause the video here, fill it out. Then once you're done, uh, we will move into the next section. Okay, so assuming that you have now finished off the um, table, we are moving into some more reading. So we're continuing on page 37 of your booklet. Um, but if you need to, you can just keep continue reading along with me as well. Let's turn my camera off again. There we go. Here we go. Changes. Okay, so childhood. So the idea of childhood is a relatively recent social uh, construct. It's constructed by changes in contemporary society. And this means that the meaning of the concept of childhood is one that is created rather than one which is natural. I mean, children have always existed. So humans have always been in different age groups, but what these age groups mean actually changes across history and in different cultures. So for example, in pre-industrial societies, children were like little adults. The distinct uh, phase of care for them was much shorter. So you would have the mum taking care of them for only a short period of time in their lives before, and then once they can kind of walk and talk, then they will be treated with the same responsibilities as adults. And the historian uh, Philippe Aries used paintings from the 13th century Holland to show this. Um, the children in the painting are engaged in the same activities as adults. And you kind of see there is a, uh, a mixture here of some different images, um, uh, sorry, not images, of some different people. So have a look at that. Okay, moving on. So child labor. Um, it was pretty common in the pre-industrial, uh, it was pretty common in the pre-industrial and early industrial society. You know, proper restrictions on child labor, so children of 10 years old and younger, came about during the industrial period. So before then, children were considered to be cheap labor. They didn't require um, really intelligence to do the task. It was very manual in what they needed to do. So it was very oppressive how people took advantage of children and children were treated very cruelly. Um, think of uh, Oliver Twist. If you've seen the, or read the film, I've uh, read the book or seen the film, uh, highly recommend it. But you see in the very early stages, um, children being used to, uh, you know, push things, to thread needles and all, all these sort of things, which is very, very basic manual labor. And they were paid very, very little. Uh, Mary Poppins is another classic one with the uh, children being chimney sweeps as well, because they were smaller, could fit. Um, so when it comes to education, so the speed of technological change in the 19th century and the growing needs for numerate math skills and literature, so it's your reading and writing skills, workforce meant the state education was introduced in 1870 in England. Workers who could read and write were more productive. Also, soldiers with the same skills were more effective. As a result the injust of industrialization and state education, the concept of childhood as being separate from adulthood began to emerge. Childhood was characterized by dependence on adults, innocence, 
and the need to be taught, developed, and nurtured by responsible adults. This then comes into teenagers. So the concept of a teenager uh, emerged after the Second World War when there was a boom in industry and high levels of employment meant that young people had a disposable income and this led to the creation of youth markets. So these are like forms of clothing and entertainment aimed specifically at this new group with money to spend. We may take this for granted now, however, this was very new in the 1950s and 60s. So from my parents' generation more so, um, and the generation perhaps of your uh, maybe grandparents would be around, would be able to identify from this region, uh, from this time in particular. So anytime that there's a new market that comes into place, so people have come in, brought money, then in this case, a whole entire new market develop so all the products which you take for granted um, you can now think your parents and grandparents this brings on to child-centered families so we're coming up to today so families have become increasingly child-centered which is they're organized around the me the needs of the child think of the child at the center we put the child's needs and interests first before all other members of the family and in industrialized, uh, industrial society, the phrase children should be seen and not heard was very common. However, now children are consulted in family affairs and the decisions are often made putting the needs of the children first. Some argue that children or child-centeredness has gone too far and that children grow up too fast with access to technology that the parents don't understand and that discipline is not strong enough anymore. And I'm quite curious as to uh, what you sort of think on this and maybe I'll... Uh, later down the line, develop some sort of forum for us to be able to have a discussion around this. But I want you to have a look at the image on the right. You can see that there, you got your child in the middle and all these things that focus around the child. So anytime a child will start at the top, you've got uh, Madeleine McCann. Uh, anytime you know, a child goes missing, it creates uh, you know, a bit of a panic. Uh, I would say that it is not fair to really use Madeleine McCann because it's probably one of the most that is probably the most uh, globalized and most global missing child, missing persons case that we have. Moving around, compulsory education. As you all know too well, that if you don't turn up to school, that does result in consequences in the often in the appearance of fines. You have smaller families. Um, so being a smaller family, meaning that uh, there is a lot more focus on you. Whereas if I'm one of, let's say 12 children, the focus is very much not on me. Um, increased affluence. This means that with more money to spend, there is more money you can spend on your children. Um, decrease in infant and mortality rates. Um, so this means that your likelihood of survival as a child is going up. So more we have a greater chance of your children the child surviving and an increase in divorce rates, meaning you've got a lot of single child, uh, single parent families as well. The welfare state exists to support uh, families who might be struggling, particularly single mothers. Um, also, uh, families who have a lot of children have access to uh, greater funding from the, well, uh, from the government. Pediatrics exists, and this is the science of childhood. So this is specific doctors that exist to help parents uh, understand, look after their children. Um, they do all sorts of things. So don't ask me, I'm not an expert. Consumerism. Now, the teen market is huge in this day and age, and it is so evident when I see you guys on Mufti Day, um, all the different things which you guys have bought from the stores. You guys like to come in and show it off at school, and people know that uh, selling things to teens is a huge market because you, believe it or not, have the highest disposable income at this point in time. You don't have bills, you don't have rent, you don't have all sorts of things that you need to pay, loans and, and car repayments and everything else. You get some pocket money or you get some money from work, which you can mostly spend on anything you want. I, I know that some of you guys might have a phone bill, but for the most part, it is a very, very, uh, it's, it's a very small amount that you would have to pay comparative to someone like me who has, you know, I will spend my money on food that I need, um, whereas you tend to spend your money on food which you don't need. So you have still get your meals from home, but I still see you guys all packed into the chicken shops. Then changes in law. So children's rights, children's courts, 
um, family court, this has all been a uh, rather new thing that has come about and is continually evolving. You guys are seen as protected, um, as in the number of laws that protect, you know, particularly uh, your identities, images of you. Um, it is also considered to be, you get a lot harsher penalties for assault on a child, sexual assault in particular. So that, that all demonstrates that society is does have the interests of the child and will put the child's needs before uh, a lot of other people. Then we bring brings us to the impact of technology. And Supama, 2007, argues that children are deprived of a proper childhood. For example, quality time at the family is now replaced by TV, social media, and mobile phones. She argues childhood has become toxic with too many adult conveniences polluting what should be a stage of innocence. And this would have been a fantastic discussion to have in class. Um, I Unfortunately, well, we won't be able to do that now. So think about this. Um, if I want you to apply this more to your own lives since having the introduction of technology. Do you think that there would be, uh, you would probably spend more time with, away from your quality time with your family had you not had the phone? I think the answer is obvious there, but um, does this necessarily, is this necessarily a bad thing? And that's where the debate comes in. Okay, so your homework that I want you to do. Now, hopefully you have already um, started this for those of you who are in the last class. It's very easy. It's a reading homework and it is essential for you to do this if you want to be able to do the next class, which is going to be on Marxism and the Marxist views on families. So please make sure that you read that uh, and answer the multiple choice questions. It should take you no more than 10 minutes and therein we'll end the lesson. Now, if you have any questions, again, you can email me. Uh, as this sort of time evolves, you will then be updated. I'll keep you updated in, my best, in the best possible way. Uh, hopefully we can get a forum going and we'll see how we can go from there. But for the meantime, I'll leave it there.